there, there is no subject that I get more questions on than uh, Article 28 clinics. I constantly, people are asking, there's an awful lot of misconception about Article 28s. Uh, and basically, that was, is going to be our topic, uh, our last topic today. There are really three basic types of, of uh, Article 28s, the ones that are in the hospital based, uh, the ones that are, are uh, county based, and the community clinic. And the community clinic is getting a great deal of, of publicity because of uh, President Obama. There are two minor, or I shouldn't say minor, there are two offshoots, uh, the school based Article 28 and the specific uh, directed Article 28, such as the UPC clinic in, in, uh, in Elmira. But our last speaker, Sanjita Jahedra, is, uh, res er, earned her dental degree in India. She has a, an MPH from the University of Illinois. She has, uh, uh, did her dental public res uh, health residency at the health department under uh, Dr. Kumar. Her topic this afternoon is the role of the community clinic and outreach programs in oral health. Dr. Jahidra is uh, an associate director of the outreach program for the Division of Community and Preventive Dentistry at Eastman Dental Center, and that is her tie to, obviously, uh, to our first uh, speaker this afternoon. She has published uh, in um, oral health and pregnancy, as well as uh, has published the survey of dentists and hygienists on oral cancer detection and prevention. Um, I give you our uh, fifth and final speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a great privilege for me to be here, um, actually to be, uh, be presenting at this meeting. I would like to t uh, thank Dr. Curran especially to include me with this distinguished uh, panel of speakers who were here before me. In fact, it's making me feel so elated. And I think I've added a couple of inches to my short frame. <laughs> um, anyway, what I'm going to discuss today is um, um, I'm going to focus on oral health access issues and the importance of community clinics and outreach programs in our, in, that help in reducing this problem. I'd like to start this presentation with some examples of dental public health problems, particularly among the underserved population. <clears throat> the first example is a 10-year-old boy who has a throbbing abscess is terrified to go to the dentist and wants all his teeth removed with gas. <clears throat> a mother of a developmentally disabled child cannot find a dentist anywhere near her home to treat her child. A 45-year-old man who has HIV AIDS has been robbed and is in pain with a number of broken teeth. He calls at least 25 dentists in his community for treatment. They all refuse to treat him. The problem goes on. A school nurse is frustrated by the number of children who need dental care but cannot afford it. Dental care is the most requested health service of a state Medicaid program with 4,000 calls a month, followed by mental health with 700. And if you look at this, uh, it's almost seven times the number for dental, which is quite a lot. An inner city neighborhood wants to know whether dentistry should be included in their newly developing community health center. These are all examples used by Dr. Myron Al Alukian in uh, an article in the journal, uh, The Dental Clinics of North America, published in 2008. But all these examples that I've listed could happen in your community, could happen anywhere. And um, uh, I think we really need to address this problem. Um, you all must have heard about Demon Driver, the 12-year-old boy from Maryland who died as a result of dental uh, complications arising out of dental uh, abscess, as well as because he, he could not access dental care. There, this particular case got a lot of media hype. And so um, uh, 
all uh, Maryland and other states tried to address this issue. But there were other two cases, one in New York in Bronx and um, one in Texas that also had similar outcomes. When we talk about oral health in America, the first thing that comes to my mind is the Surgeon General's report in 2000, published in 2000. Uh, this was the first ever report on oral health, and um, this report talked about how oral health is essential for a healthy America, how dental care is essential to overall health. And we all know that health care is a shared responsibility and that prevention pays. Now, when I talk about prevention, the first thing that comes to my mind as a dentist is fluoridation, water fluoridation and you all know the battles that you had to face um, in Corning. Uh, the other um, uh, preventive mod uh, modalities that of treatment are, of course, sealants. These are all well tried, well tested, and are, uh, there's a lot of evidence out there to show the effectiveness of sealants. And of course, um, professionally applied fluorides. Improving oral health literacy makes patients better stewards of their own health. What I mean over here is that one has to be culturally competent um, to be able to treat your patients. Um, your staff, you, you yourself, should be able to um, communicate um, uh, adequately so that the patient understands what you're trying to tell them. Um, you should have um, uh, educational materials which are in uh, different languages if that's what your population that you're treating um, needs. Also, um, cultural competency also means that uh, you have to uh, have staff that are bilingual or multilingual if it is necessary. Patients need a dental home. Um, Institute of Medicine last month convened a, convened a meeting and talked about a health home for all. And um, you all have heard of a dental home for children, uh, which uh, is now being promoted uh, by the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics, as well as dental um, uh, public uh, about, uh, from the dental uh, pediatric dentistry group. And um, so I think that all patients need a dental home. And access is a key to good oral health. When you talk about improving oral health in America, um, there one requires a strong public health infrastructure to overcome obstacles to care. The infrastructure for dental public health is the foundation upon which the public dental health, uh, health programs and activities are assessed, planned, executed, and evaluated. And of course, reimbursement matters. It's important that you get paid for what you do. Uh, improving access in underserved areas requires extra market incentives. Patients with the greatest needs must be first in line for care. And of course, cost-effective allocation of limited government funds is essential. You have to utilize your funds effectively. The government must fund public health benefit programs adequately. Some of the factors that affect oral health access are location. Um, if your population is in rural areas or in the inner cities or urban areas, then you can have access issues. Funding, um, oral health literacy, I just uh, talked about it. Uh, health status, uh, safety net clinics, socioeconomic status, um, it could be higher income or lower income, but usually the lower income is the one that has access problems. And of course, health behaviors, and this is one that is really, really difficult to change. And uh, when we talk about workforce issues, you have to see that um, uh, there are enough dentists and dental hygienists for the population served. What are the solutions for these um, oral health access problems? Um, it is really important to increase collaboration. Uh, increase collaboration with your medical providers. Um, as you all know, uh, I think Dr. Uh, Kumar mentioned about um, how pediatricians are now applying varnish in North Carolina, and uh, as well as in um, uh, uh, UCSF study has shown that uh, fluoride varnish can be used in the community by um, non-dental providers. 
um, you also um, need to th think of changing perceptions about the importance of oral health. Um, not everybody thinks that your mouth is important, and uh, uh, the public perception also has to change uh, as far as uh, your oral health um, uh, is concerned. Also, increase workforce diversity, capacity, and flexibility. And uh, this will include all the different models that are now being tried in different states, um, in the state of Alaska, in the state of Minnesota, uh, uh, in terms of mid-level providers. Also, you have to build a science base. So in other words, you have to make sure that whatever you do is evidence-based and replicate effective programs. If any of the programs that are successful, then it's important to um, you know, duplicate or replicate it in your community. So the question is, is there really a solution? One has to confidently tread on the path. You all must uh, be aware of uh, how the state of um, Alaska has brought in a mid-level provider, a dental therapist. But what I think is important now that, yes, uh, a mid-level provider, the dental therapist is being tried in Alaska, but it's important to evaluate after a time how effective the use of a new provider or a mid-level provider is going to affect the um, access issues. We know that it works in different in other countries, but is it um, going to work in Alaska? The same thing uh, is um, in terms of uh, expanded functions for dental hygienists. I think um, it's important that uh, we have to consider all these models, but after it uh, is implemented, it's important that you go back and evaluate them and see if um, it's actually um, doing what we have brought it uh, uh, what we are um, supposed to, what it's supposed to be doing, that is reduce um, dental problems. Um, and then, um, I, being a dental public health professional, I'm going to give you some numbers. Uh, as far as medical insurance is concerned, there are 47 million um, people who lack medical insurance. And two and a half times that number, that is about 108 million Americans, lack dental insurance. Vulnerable po populations are more at risk for unmet oral health needs, and these include low-income families, racial and ethnic minority groups, the uninsured, traffic location, it could be rural or inner city. It has been seen that over 2,000 counties or partial counties have been designated as dental health professional shortage areas. Children from families without dental insurance are three times more likely to have dental needs than children with either public or private insurance. So the need is really big in um, the vulnerable populations. In 2000, while 48% of the privately insured had at least one dental visit, only 29% of the publicly insured and 19% of the uninsured did. So you can see there's a big difference between uh, uh, the ones that have the ones that have private insurance. You have 48 percent of them, and um, uh, only 29 percent having uh, public insurance, being able to have one dental visit um, in 2000. And the number nationally is 42 percent um, of the population with one dental visit. Dr. Kumar had talked about um, the national dental expenditures, and um, I have a slide that, that shows you. Um, it, over here you can see that 86.6 billion um, was, was spent on personal dental services in 2005. This is about 5.5 times from 1980. Uh, there's an increase of 5.5 times. And this number, 86.6 uh, billion, is just about 5% of the total that is spent on healthcare. So really, dental is not a lot. And then this slide here shows you um, how much is being spent out of pocket in private insurance. Out of the 86.6 billion, 81.4 billion is uh, from out of pocket and private health insurance. Only 5.2 is for uh, public health uh, programs, 4.5 on Medicaid.
In 2006, in the United States, over 55 million of the most vulnerable Americans were enrolled in Medicaid. More than 6 million were enrolled in state um, child health insurance program. And closer home, coming to New York State, in 2006, 3.7 million were on Medicaid, and there were more than 2 million children eligible for child or teen health programs, which included dental. And um, there are about 42 managed care um, organizations that are included in Medicaid um, uh, program. So there's um, a lot of um, different um, programs that, uh, recently that were introduced, and um, uh, some of the programs have removed dental out of it. We are having the same problem at Eastman Dental, where um, some of our Medicaid uh, recipients have been uh, changed to uh, Fidelis, and Fidelis doesn't have dental anymore. So we had to actually stop treatment, and um, that's really sad because uh, patients were being given care and now um, you know we had to stop them especially because this is a population that is very difficult to come and actually um, uh, present themselves for treatment once they start coming that means they're really interested in getting um, their mouth treated and um, now because of the insurance uh, changes they're not able to access care um, study in 2006 by Medicaid identified several barriers, and some of the barriers were lack of sufficient providers, lack of adequate transportation, shortage of dentists willing to treat Medicaid population. Also, some of the managed care organizations and the fee-for-service beneficiaries were unaware that they were entitled to receive dental services. So these were the uh, barriers uh, in in, uh, amongst the uh, Medicaid recipients who actually um, weren't, uh, be, uh, weren't able to access care. And then I have this um, uh, map over here of uh, New York State, and I've only selected some counties which are around um, uh, uh, Rochester, where I come from, and of course uh, Corning. Uh, what I wanted to show in this is that um, New York State, the um, dental utilization rate is 27%. It's really low. 27% um, of Medicaid uh, recipients actually access dental care. Uh, the upstate rate is the same. It's 27%. Uh, Schuyler County has the lowest, 17%. And um, Rockland, which is um, over here, uh, has the highest 36. So the range is from 17 to 36 percent for accessing dental care. Um, the county I come from, Monroe, is about 30 percent, and then you can see Steuben and um, Tioga are in uh, less than 20 percent, and then we have um, uh, Allegheny and uh, Livingston in Ontario, 21 to 23 percent. Eighth, uh, uh, Shimang. 24 uh, to 27%. So, um, I mean, looking at these utilization rates, one wonders that there really needs to, something needs to be done in order to improve this. I'm sure you all have heard of the Healthy People 2010. Um, we always talk about the Healthy People 2010 because that's uh, our goal or that's the objective that you have to keep in mind whenever you do public health programs. Uh, as far as um, uh, health centers are concerned, as far as the topic that I'm presenting, there is an objective. The objective is to increase the proportion of local health departments and community-based health centers, including community migrant and homeless health centers that have an oral health component to 75%. And what was the baseline? It was 34% of local jurisdictions and health centers had oral health components in 1997. So it's really a low number. Um, and for the 2010 uh, objectives, it was in 2000 that these um, objectives were written. So um, they, their baseline was 34, and they wanted it to come up to 75. Let's see if we've really come up to that number, or will we really achieve that objective by 2010? As far as New York State is concerned, 
Um, one of the goals um, in the New York State Oral Health Plan was to improve access to high quality, comprehensive, continuous oral health services for all New Yorkers and to eliminate disparities for vulnerable populations. And some objectives were written to improve access by 2010. Some of the strategies to achieve this um, goal as well as objectives were to simplify administrative processes. Uh, I think you all must be aware that there's too much paperwork involved with, um, uh, you know, trying to serve the underserved population uh, or uh, to do, uh, uh, provide treatment for Medicaid patients. Also, uh, some of the, uh, another strategy is to explore incentives for dentists. Also, development of loan repayment incentives for dentists and dental hygienists. Um, uh, our uh, downtown center, uh, Eastman Dental Center, uh, we have a loan repayment uh, incentive for dentists. Um, and we actually have a couple of dentists who avail of this. Um, and that's how we have uh, some faculty who are still there in the program uh, providing care to the underserved population. Um, also, uh, we need to um, uh, explore models from other states that allow dental hygiene to bill for services provided in schools, nursing homes, and such other public health settings. Um, the other strategies are to promote services that allow patients greater access to oral health care, including mobile and portable dental programs, school-based prevention and treatment, case management or care coordination. And I think you all must have heard about uh, the BroomMax uh, case management program. Uh, I think it's pretty successful. Uh, Dr. Kumar talked about um, uh, case management, and I don't want to go into the details about it. Um, the, um, the other strategy is to increase the number of safety net dental clinics and their capacity to provide care and identify barriers to including dental care in existing community health, health clinics and hospitals. To address the dental care access problem, public and uh, voluntary organizations have developed dental clinics to provide services to populations that are unable to purchase private sector care. Collectively, these clinics are known as dental safety net clinics. These have a specific interest in providing dental care to low income and other underserved population. Uh, they provide a very small proportion of overall dental care. It's less than 5%. And they're usually sponsored by and are, uh, are situated in public health departments, in community health centers, Indian health service clinics, private not-for-profit service agencies, usually social service agencies, dental schools, dental hygiene programs, school-based clinics, and mobile dental vans. The priorities of a dental cent uh, health center uh, program must be, first of all, very important, to decrease the existing di dental disease burden in the ta target population and to prevent disease from starting in the youngest members of the population. So they have to actually come up with str uh, strategies with um, uh, programs which um, will prevent a disease in, um, uh, in younger children, um, like the use of fluoride varnish, which is now quite popu gaining popularity these days. So I'm now going to focus on um, health centers. Um, these are federally um, uh, funded, and they are an approach for improving dental care access for all people. Um, these include community health centers, migrant health centers, programs for the homeless, public housing primary care programs. And their main funding is um, federal. Uh, they are called federally qualified health centers or safety net facilities. Um, some of the, uh, the other type of health center is federally qualified health center lookalikes and outpatient health programs or facilities operated by the tribal organizations. Um, some of the health center program fundamentals are that they are always located in or serve a high need community. 
They are governed by a community board. At least 51% of um, the members are, uh, the board members are actually uh, patients who um, uh, get care from that health center. Um, they, uh, these health centers provide comprehensive primary health care. So basically, they uh, offer services that help their patients access health care, uh, the so-called enabling services. And they provide services available to all. Uh, in other words, even if the person doesn't have insurance, they are obliged to provide services. If they don't have uh, money, um, any income level, they still have to provide services. Uh, they have to meet other performance and accountability requirements <coughs> administrative, clinical, and financial operations. Currently, the health centers across the country provide primary care and other services to over 16 million patients. The Community Health Center Program is a significant provider of oral health care for the nation's medically underserved. Uh, in fact, since 2002, all new health centers must assure access to oral health care services. Uh, actually, it was an in, uh, initiative that was introduced by the Bush government um, that all health centers from 2002 would, be, uh, would need to have an oral health um, uh, uh, component. And um, HRSA provided $3.5 million for new uh, access to oral health in uh, 2002 and about 10 million um, for oral health expansions in fiscal year 2005. And so now there are 73% of existing federally funded healthcare centers which provide oral health services on site in 2003. So we are almost achieving our uh, Healthy uh, People 2010 goal of 75%. And then I have this um, figures that will uh, that kind of illustrate that the major growth that started in uh, 2002, and you can see you can see that in um, the total dental visits jumped from 2002, uh, and it's gone to 4.73 uh, average um, dental visits. Uh, and 2.34 uh, total dental services patients. Uh, and it kind of shows, this slide shows how it has grown. Um, and also over here, this slide shows that 10% of um, uh, total health care, 10% uh, is for dental services out of the total visits for um, health uh, at the health centers from two th in 2005. And then there are four different major categories of uh, treatment that are available by, or provided by the health centers. Uh, preventive, which includes exam, x-rays, uh, fluorides, sealants, uh, and trophies. Uh, restorative is, um, uh, includes um, pro uh, providing restorations to um, damaged or injured teeth. Um, emergency is for oral infections and injuries, and rehabilitative includes um, uh, endodontics, prosthodontic, and periodontics. And you can see that the percent of um, health centers that provided preventive care was 73.4%. 68.7% um, of health centers provided restorative services, and 69% provided emergency. As far as uh, rehabilitative, it was only 46%, but they made 95% available um, to their patients. 95% of the health centers made it available, so that means they either referred it somewhere and, or um, you know, they had um, the um, uh, specialty uh, practice coming to their health centers. So uh, I think health centers uh, really are making a difference as far as dental services are concerned. Um, health centers are also fairly evenly distributed in urban and rural um, areas. Uh, in 2005, more than 52% of all federally funded um, grantees were located in rural areas. Uh, the urban centers were more likely than rural centers to deliver oral health services on site. And you can see that this is for urban, 
versus uh, rural. You see 78 um, percent, 75. All these um, lighter bars are higher than the rural, rural centers. Um, and also, uh, rural health centers account for over 40 percent of total dental service patients and encounters. Um, this bar over here, the top one, is for uh, rural health centers. Um, and the same way for their uh, full-time uh, equivalent staff and uh, dentists. They're over 40% um, uh, in uh, rural areas. The Institute of Medicine in 2003 specifically recognized the importance of community health centers, stating that the community health center model has proven effective not only in increasing access to care, but also in improving health outcomes for the often higher risk populations they serve. I have a slide here that um, just talks about the new payment method for most uh, Medicaid outpatient services. This was the ambulatory care payment reform, and it's called the APG, or Ambulatory Patient Group System. Um, it was supposed to have been implemented this month in March, but they have deferred it a bit. Um, the, it's going to be phased in four, in the next four years um, pe uh, period, and this was one of the first major changes in uh, New York Medicaid um, outpatient reimbursement system. Uh, it's happened after 20 years and results in higher payments for higher intensity services and lower payments for lower intensity services across all settings. So basically, upstate has a different rate versus uh, downstate. And uh, the base rates are service specific. So you have ambulatory surgery or emergency department and outpatient department. And they vary by region, as I said, upstate versus <coughs> downstate. These base, base rates um, uh, finally were calculated by uh, an APG weight for a, dip, uh, for a visit to determine the final fee. So um, it's going to be different now for Medicaid in the next four years. Um, it, whatever is the existing system, it's going to be phased in. So from this month onwards, they had decided that only 25% would be the APG system and 75% would be the new, um, uh, would be the old system that was uh, being used for payment or towards reimbursement. And then after one year, it was going to be 50 and 50 and then uh, 75 and 25. And finally, uh, APG completely. Um, actually, it uh, brings down the payment um, to some extent uh, to these um, uh, uh, health centers. Um, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about community outreach programs. <coughs> Public health and dental educators have found community outreach programs to be an increasingly effective solution for addressing unmet oral health needs. School-based programs have been deemed successful as a means of reaching underserved children. Um, I'm really going to talk about our uh, Eastman Dental program and um, where I'm, I come from. Uh, this is one of the oldest programs, I, I believe, in the country maybe, but definitely in New York State. It was founded in um, 1915, and um, it was founded to provide dental care to indigent um, children. Um, I actually presented, um, uh, I evaluated the program and presented it um, at the 2006 uh, National Oral Health Conference meeting. And so some of my data is from that time. Uh, we have um, sort of switched our um, uh, system to Axiom and I wasn't able to uh, get, um, you know, uh, new data. So it's a little old, but I don't think there's much changes in the data. Uh, as far as um, community dentistry and oral uh, prevention division is concerned, uh, we've really expanded um, and uh, in the past, especially in the past 36 years, we have uh, established a collaborative outreach dental program in inner city and neighboring rural communities. Um, we have seven, we used to have seven service sites, one of the sites closed down. But um, in this um, slide, we have seven service slides, uh, sites, three of uh, which are mobile vans, two inner city community health centers, which includes a school-based program, uh, one rural center, that's the one that closed down. Uh, sorry, uh, that's the one that closed down. It was in Mount Morris. 
And then we uh, have one site in a children's residential treatment facil facility. Um, the um, uh, providers that are in this program are mainly general dentists, but we also have pediatric dentists and we have uh, dental residents. Now the dental residents are from GPR, they are from AGD, and um, uh, they are also from uh, specialty um, uh, pediatric dentistry. Um, we have dental hygienists and a big team of um, dental assistants and staff. And one thing which uh, um, I really appreciate in our program is that every provider always has a dental assistant. We make sure that uh, it's one-on-one, -on -one, one is to one. So it's real, uh, you know, it makes life easy when you have an assistant. Um, these are the demographic characteristics of uh, patients seen at the seven sites, and uh, this is uh, data from 2005. We had about 54% female and 46% male. Um, we saw more children, 73%. Uh, by race, um, African Americans were 52%, Caucasians 32 Hispanic 15%. And um, you can see that uh, we served about 87% Medicaid and Child Health Plus. Uh, only 4% of private insurance and 9% was self-pay. We also have a sliding fee scale. We have a grant from um, HRSA, which um, uh, where we see patients who, are, uh, who have a low income uh, and they have to pay, uh, do, make a co-payment of $10 or $15 per visit. And when we know that uh, the, uh, the patient is on that grant, we try to do as much as possible during that visit so that the patient doesn't have to keep paying, come up with that $10 or $15. <laughs> And uh, this slide gives you an idea of the distribution of treatment provided. The total number of patients that we saw in 2005 was 7,000, with about 21,700 patient visits. And then uh, for diagnostic, which included exams and x-rays, it was 21% um, um, uh, of uh, visits. Uh, preventive, which included prophy, fluorides, and sealants, it was 39%. Restorative was 25%. Uh, and then, of course, we do provide comprehensive care. There are some providers who do comprehensive care uh, in terms of uh, doing root canals. Um, we have providers who definitely um, do dentures. And um, uh, also, uh, the residents try to uh, do some per uh, periodontics, uh, definitely oral surgery. Um, so it's a kind of a comprehensive care at our um, different sites. And then this slide again gives you uh, an idea of um, from 2001 to 2005, what were the, uh, the total number of visits, patient visits, and um, uh, unduplicated patient numbers, and um, uh, these are the total visits. So. Um, uh, it's uh, steady, but um, I can assure you that in the next two or three years, we're going to have a lot of changes, and these numbers will um, uh, change um, uh, if I present uh, the results uh, of my evaluation after a couple of years, because we are expanding one of the sites, and we are going to have more residents uh, uh, in our uh, uh, outreach program. Um, and um, we had this um, migrant worker program in Mount Morris, and um, we used to serve, um, uh, provide care in summer, during summer, uh, and um, this slide gives you an idea of um, the migrant worker visits from 2001 to 2005. Um, this slide gives you an idea about uh, mobile van uh, patient visits for um, diagnostic and preventive treatment in uh, 2005. And you can see that um, more patients um, were seen who, uh, under the age of 14 years versus, um, you know, uh, above 14 years. But that's because our program, uh, I think it's because um, the uh, Smile Mobile Vans went to elementary schools and uh, um, so uh, that's why the numbers are like that. Um, and then the same way for fluoride. Um, less than 14 years, the numbers were higher than um, 
more than 14 years. And this is the data for sealants. Um, and then we do have collaborative partnerships and community involvement with the city school districts, with the Head Start program, um, with the state and county health department um, utility com company because um, they actually um, hook up our Smile Mobile van and uh, uh, it's all done um, at uh, either free, um, I mean, they um, don't charge us for it or at minimum cost. And then, of course, we have a volunteer dentist program, and I think I see two dentists over here who are part of our volunteer dentist program, uh, and we really, really appreciate uh, them coming um, to our um, uh, sites. Uh, they come uh, twice uh, a month, on two days of the month, and um, uh, treat patients. Um, they have a regular schedule, and uh, we love having them over, and uh, they're right here. Uh, you can, uh, Dr. Rosinski and um, Dr. John Sementelli, both of them are part of our volunteer dentist program. Um, and then um, uh, our program, um, uh, we, we do a lot of education in the community. We um, go out and uh, do oral health promotional lectures. Uh, I've done several at uh, different um, uh, senior centers. Um, there are some of our hygienists have gone into uh, the classrooms and um, done, um, uh, you know, uh, oral health education. We um, never miss any health fairs in in and around uh, Rochester. Uh, we always have a table, and uh, we try to you know, uh, increase awareness of uh, oral health issues. Uh, we do field trips. Um, uh, uh, children are brought into our facilities from schools um, to, uh, you know, actually visit and see what um, a dental clinic is like, and um, you know, we expose them to uh, dentistry. Um, our community outreach uh, clinical uh, program. Uh, most of the dental residents uh, undergo a rotation from advanced education in general dentistry, from general practice res residency, and pediatric dentistry residency. Um, since last year, uh, we have two residents from uh, advanced education in general dentistry who are completely um, doing a one-year rotation with us. Uh, I've developed the didactics for, uh, there are only two of them, but I've developed the didactics for them. And um, we've uh, tried to um, expose them to um, community uh, dentistry. We've tried to um, uh, focus dental health um, uh, in terms of uh, the seminars and lectures that um, we give. And um, it's been an excellent experience for them as well as for us. Um, uh, they're going to be finishing their rotation in June, and then we're going to continue with uh, two more next year. So this is going to be an ongoing uh, thing for community dentistry, and it's really a um, nice experience for the faculty in community dentistry. Um, and I would like to uh, remind you all that um, a community health center dental clinic is not the same as a private practice. Um, in fact, um, uh, we have problems. We have problems of recruiting and retaining faculty. Um, we've got all the problems that um, you know private practice doesn't have to face uh, in terms of um, you know your um, uh, tr trying to keep the faculty. And um, uh, first of all, um, the salary is not as good as in private practice. Uh, and so most of the uh, faculty that we have uh, usually come in when they're fresh uh, from the Nell School or just come out of residency. And um, then uh, they get their experience over here, which is really a nice experience. Um, and of course, um, it's more lucrative to you know, go into private practice after that. So we usually have um, faculty that are there for a short while. But I am here since uh, three, three and a half years, and I love it, and I love it with a passion. And uh, I think um, if um, you know, you're really dedicated or committed to serving the underserved population or the population uh, that um, uh, the outreach program sees, 
I think um, you can have more people who would be able to continue uh, providing care here. In fact, this morning, Dr. Kirpen talked about uh, an agenda where he asked all of you that you must see one or two uh, pregnant, underserved population patients in your practice. And I would request that you all must see all patients uh, from the underserved population. Even adding one or two in your practice every week will make a big, 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 big difference. Um, so uh, I think uh, that's all that I wanted to tell, that the need is really extensive and sometimes it can be overwhelming. But it's really, really a rewarding experience. And I'm going to tell you uh, an um, uh, example that happened. Um, a patient of mine, um, a 38-year-old patient, I um, can never, never forget what happened. The day I delivered the denture, she, she was 38 years and she didn't have teeth for like eight or 10 years. and. Um, she, I can never forget the shriek and the tears of joy of this patient when I delivered the denture and she saw her say, uh, herself when I gave her the mirror because uh, all these are, you know, very uh, enriching experiences uh, in um, uh, working in this outreach program. Thank you. Definitely. Absolutely. I agree. I have a specific question. Um, I, don't, I thought the APG system mm -hmm. seems confusing, and I think almost everybody does. I think so. Um, is this your prediction that it's going to decrease payments to healthcare centers, or is it, is it known? Is no, they problem? haven't yet. Um, they've come up with um, some numbers. And I think every facility, it will be different because that's how they're going to calculate it. But uh, it's based, um, overall, it's going to be based on um, some, uh, according to the weights that each procedure is given by the system. And um, so I think it's going to decrease. Um, but again, it's not uh, something, because there's a lot of training sessions that uh, they've uh, asked uh, administrators to attend. Uh, to understand this, so uh, I, I'm not sure if, uh, yeah. Anybody who's considering enrolling in Medicaid, this is really just for the Article 28 clinics, not for private fee-for-service Medicaid providers. I think yes. it's for everybody, no, no, right? No, no, just, it, you're right. It's only for Article 28. Yeah. The APG system? The APG system is just for Article 28 clinics. Yeah, not, no impact on private practitioners. Who accept Medicaid? Even if they accept Medicaid, no. One of the things that it will do is, just so that you know, the thing that took place 20 years ago, something like that, were DRGs, which were diagnostic-related groupings, so that if you went into the hospital and you had a gallbladder, you got a global fee, provided there were no complications, uh, instead of uh, adding everything up, it was just made it simple. It says, if this patient gets out in two days, that's fine. If the patient gets out in five days, you're going to get paid the same amount. What this means in relation to Article 28 is that it makes, takes them from being minimalist and hopefully makes them maximalist. Minimalist, I mean, is there, in, in our clinic, we get paid $63.70 no matter what we do. So that it, it, the obvious thing is, if you're only going to get paid that much, don't do too much. And what they're trying to do is get away from that. So the APGs can really say to the patient, or say to the, the clinic, listen, if you do this, this you're going to get paid 100% if you do this. But if you do this, this, and this, you'll get paid 50% of that. So if the patient is sitting in that chair, it, it really uh, entices you into doing more. So I think that's the biggest thing. And I don't think it will be less payment. I really think it will be more payment. You know? Well, um, uh, for instance, um, I just uh, found out that if um, you're doing a two-surface billing, 
And if you want to do another two surface filling, then the second one will be 50% only yes. of the first. It, it's, so it's, if you're doing quadrant, then you yeah, kind the, of you're losing out. Well, on the, 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 the problem involved in our clinic mm -hmm. is the patient only gets the two surface filling most of the time. And at least if they are going to do quadrant genesis, they can do it and get 50% uh, of, of the additional amount. There's a big effort just to get the patient there. Just to get, yes. Right. One of the things that they hope that it isn't in the, 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 it isn't in the works yet. Uh, what, what is holding this up is federal, federal uh, approval. They, they got the system all going, then they mm -hmm. found out that they didn't do, get the federal approval yet. So that's what's holding it up right now. But one of the things they hope to do is that if you go into a community clinic, which is both medical and dental, in the past, if you went to the medical clinic and you wanted, you drove 75 miles to get there, and you wanted to go to the dental clinic, they could not charge you for your dental visit. I mean, it just wasn't possible. So one of the things that they want to do, and it hasn't been, that hasn't been finished yet, is they want to be able to get a family to get multiple visits when they're, they've driven a long distance. So I, I think that, their, their heart is in the, in the right place. And, uh, you know, this comes out of the administration that took over uh, when Spitzer came in. And it took them a year to kind of get their, their feet on the ground. And they really wanted to get this off, off the ground. And I think Sanjita uh, described it well in saying that they're going to phase it in so that it will be 25% of the Article 20 uh, uh, clinic fee the first year, then 50, then 75, then 100%. So maybe a loss of adjustment of those formulas. Mm -hmm. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. The idea of becoming more productive and then ultimately higher reimbursement can have effect. I, I think this is the way that they want to, they want to break out of, of, the, of the concept of, uh, of uh, having one single fee and, and I think that the other thing, what, it, they, this, what this allows you to do is that it actually kind of separates medicine and dentistry in the sense that dentistry does not operate exactly the same as medicine and it will allow, in the past, whether if you went to the cl clinic and you were a medical patient or you were a dental patient, the same clinic fee. This, because it brings in procedures, uh, will, will separate it. Ellie, you look like you want to put your hand up. You want to get the hair out of your eyes. <laughs> they both count. Let me let me say to our, our speaker. I'm sorry. Please, Ron. Before you close the session, I'd just like to make one comment related to Sanjita's very thorough presentation. Uh, I think that the fact that the Sanjita is very thorough I, I think it, in addition to that, uh, to, to echo what you have to say, is wait, we have 4.5 million in New York State that are on some type of government uh, program of either Family Health Plus, Child Health Plus, or Medicaid. We have 2.5 million more that are out there that are going to be added some way, somehow, by the federal and state government in the next few years. Wait till that. 
that, that I mean, that's where <coughs> we come. What, what, the way we should close today is to say, you know, in order to answer this problem, we're going to need all the resources that we have in the private sector and all the, reasons, all the resources that we have in the government sector. This is the purpose of this, of this uh, discussion today. It's a partnership that we're trying to forge between the public and the uh, private sector in order to improve oral health. It takes everybody, and you, everybody has to be involved. Thank you for coming. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you, Thank you to our, our host and projectionists uh, uh, here at, at Corning Incorporated. Have a good, safe trip. <laughs>